Welcome back to Ash Updates. This is abstract number four, Gem Caesar. It's entitled A Curative Strategy for High-Risk Smoldering Myeloma Post-Hoc Analysis of Sustained Undetectable Mineral Residual Disease. This is by Marie Mateos and colleagues from the Spanish group. No group has been more responsible for useless studies in smoldering myeloma than the Spanish group. They're at it again with the Gem Caesar study. I've not seen anything like this. This really boggles the mind if you think about it. And by the end of this video, I'm going to make a plea that IRBs put an end to this. We need to stop uncontrolled studies with the kitchen sink for smoldering myeloma. All right, let's see what's going on in Gem Caesar. Disclosures. Oh my God. They don't have a disclosure slide in the video. I didn't see one. I didn't even see one at the top of the session. But I noticed that the authors have many, many disclosure. Honoraria, Pfizer, Sanofi, Takeda, Oncopeptides. Aren't they the makers of that useless product, Melflufen, that's been withdrawn from market? Bristol Myers Squibb, Celgene, Janssen. I guess if you have conflicts with every one of the companies, they all cancel each other out. It's a vector of canceling out, I suppose. This is not good. It's not good to take money from all of the companies in the space and then advance market share with uncontrolled studies that are done in smoldering myeloma where you use up all these drugs, okay? This makes it seem like your primary goal is to enrich the companies and not actually to improve outcomes for patients. See, to improve outcomes for patients, you need something that Gem Caesar doesn't have. That's called a control arm. You need a control arm so you know what you're doing is better than not doing anything. They don't have that. The study gets started with teaching us a little bit about high-risk smoldering myeloma. Of course, there's nothing to teach. There's a spectrum of plasma cell clonality that goes from very, very low to full-blown myeloma. They've defined it arbitrarily as 60% or more plasma cells. That's an arbitrary definition that they have invented, the International Myeloma Working Group. They don't have randomized data that treating at that cutoff rather than any other cutoff improves survival or quality of life or is better than just observing someone till they meet CRAB criteria. They don't have that information, but they went ahead and made a definition change a few years ago. Go check out my video to UK Myeloma Group, the Slim CRAB Criteria, and essentially invented. They don't have proof that you treat those people and they benefit. Enter high-risk smoldering. Smoldering, of course, can be risk stratified by Mayo, Mayo Clinic criteria, by the Pathema criteria. They're all getting at the same thing, that obviously with certain burdens of plasma cells and exquisitely skewed free right chain ratios and more M protein and you know more aberrant markers and immunoparesis, things are worse, more likely to progress than if you don't have those things. But none of their risk models are actually that terrific because even the high risk group inevitably contains patients who will not progress. In other words, they will not have a symptomatic condition for years to come, five years, even 10 years later. And the low risk groups, no low risk group actually has a group of people in whom progression is precluded. So their risk models are all limited. They're limited by you know small sample size, by mediocre levels of validation, by discordance. It's the nature of risk models, you know? What's that old saying? Show me a model and I'll show you a guess about the future. And that's really what it is, just a guess about the future. When you have a situation like this in oncology, where the standard of care is to treat people when they're symptomatic and have end organ damage, and people try to move aggressively to treat people prior to being symptomatic, the standard has changed over the last 25 years in oncology. In the 1990s, we ran randomized controlled trials measuring early treatment versus delayed treatment and we used endpoints like overall survival to adjudicate the difference. There were at least three trials, smoldering myeloma using melphalan-containing regimens. They failed to improve overall survival, and that's why we didn't treat smoldering myeloma. Fast forward three decades later, and the role of the biopharmaceutical firms have grown tremendously. We have a plethora of riches. We have some really good drugs like bortezomib. We have some really good drugs like revlimid, but we also have an industry whose appetite is insatiable, and that appetite is not quenched by just merely treating myeloma patients. They need to treat earlier. Now, scientists, a scientist's job is to say, look, I'm happy to treat someone earlier, but you got to prove to me that that treatment is superior to delaying treatment until progression. They have never done that. The easiest way to do that is a randomized control trial measuring overall survival. We're going to talk about the Spanish study. <clears throat> it's got flaws and limit limits. It's not really suitable for making that claim. And the ECOG study, of course, was perverted when the authors crossed everyone over to treatment and they have no ability to detect a survival benefit. So we really are at a total loss. We have no evidence that treating these patients earlier is better than waiting until they have CRAB criteria. This is the study they keep calling a phase three study. I'm sorry, the sample size is less than 70 people per arm. 
less than 70 people per arm, you're not running a phase three study. I mean, there is no canonical definition of what makes something phase two or three. Your primary endpoint is progression-free survival. Your sample size is less than 70 per arm. That ain't no phase three. That's an underpowered phase two study. And here, Maria Mateos has the gall to show you the survival results of this study. This is incredibly misleading. Myeloma, all cancer needs to learn something. When you run a very small study and your primary endpoint is progression-free survival, you cannot tout secondary endpoints of that study. When there are differences observed, those differences are likely to be exaggerated or entirely spurious. And when there aren't differences observed, that doesn't rule out the presence of real differences because you have no power to look, okay? So we all know about underpowered phase two studies missing a real signal. What we don't appreciate is that when they find a signal, it's likely to be exaggerated. And if you don't agree, sit down and do the math. Do the math using power and alpha, pre and post test probability, and you'll persuade yourself very simply. Or you could read the paper by Yonides and colleagues in Nature Reviews Biotechnology. I think it's called Power Failure, or Nature Reviews Neuroscience Power Failure. It's unreliable. This is the kind of unreliable phase two data that the FDA will not use for drug approval. Notice something very clear, that even though this is a randomized study with survival benefits, these drugs do not have marketing authorization in smoldering myeloma with the claim that they improve survival because the FDA won't give them that claim. Just like it won't give that claim to BR plus POLA. That was an underpowered phase two where Matt Azar and colleagues are hanging their hat on the OS benefit, which is likely to be exaggerated or spurious. And notice Lartruvo. They only gave him an accelerated approval for that claim. They did not grant full marketing authorization. They made them do a phase three and that phase three was superimposable survival curse. This is unreliable. This is garbage. In fact, if you go on stage and you say we found a survival benefit, you're basically lying to people. Your study wasn't designed, wasn't powered, wasn't suited to ascertain a survival benefit. It is an inappropriate comment about a secondary endpoint. And had it not gone this way, you wouldn't have even talked about it. And that's part of the problem, part of the problem. So I don't think they fully understand this. They have certainly said so many misleading things. <clears throat> this trial just pushes down the vein of misleading things. Jem Caesar, smoldering myeloma patients, 90 people, too few to draw any firm conclusions. They're given <clears throat> CRD, high dose mel auto, CRD, and then Len Dex, Dex maintenance. Who the hell wants to be on Dex maintenance? Who the hell wants an auto for a condition that doesn't even need to be treated? It doesn't even need to be treated and you're putting them at the risk of an auto with treatment-related mortality? You're putting them at risk for all these drugs? This is absolutely crazy stuff. No IRB should be allowing these studies. You cannot do so many things to asymptomatic patient populations without safety guardrails in place. And what's a guardrail? Guardrail is a randomization. A guardrail is a control arm to know that if there is an increase in death, you'll be able to detect that. There's no way to detect that. These 90 people will never know if their lives were shortened or extended by participating in this ridiculous experiment. And by the way, they're not 90 average smoldering people. You can't benchmark them against anything. These are 90 very unique people. They're so unique that they're willing and able to and desire this ridiculous regimen, ridiculous regimen. By the way, it's not even standard of care, you know, in actually de novo myeloma. You do know that. CRD did not beat VRD in the cooperative group study. Didn't even beat it for PFS, which is a miserably weak endpoint. Everyone was claiming that CRD was going to be a godsend. It was no such thing. It was no better than VRD. And auto has failed. Determination has taken the teeth out of auto. Auto should no longer be the de facto referral pattern in CR1. This study is overkill even if you had myeloma. Certainly overkill if you have smoldering. By old definition, they mean the pre-slim criteria. So be that as it may, some of these people may actually have myeloma. And in fact, that turns out to be the case in table one. Objectives, this is what she says the primary objective is, the, to ascertain the undetectable MRD rate after auto transplant at three, four, and five years post this you know, ridiculous protocol. This is the problem with abstracts. They're not actually telling you what they're powered. As much grief as I gave to the ascent trial, at least they said our null hypothesis was a stringent CR rate of 60 some percent and our alternative hypothesis was 80%. They must be looking for some MRD rate. They're powered not for MRD, it's a nebulous concept, but for 40% of people to be sustained MRD negative at three years or four. They need to tell you what they're powered for. They're not telling you the statistical plan. They're omitting information. Very likely that information is gonna make them look very, very poor, is unflattering. That's why they're omitting it. But they're not actually telling you what this study is powered for. This is Trials 101. You need to provide this basic information. This is why, you know, this world we live in where press releases and abstracts guide treatment is a mistaken world. 
This is absolutely unacceptable. Tell me what you're actually pining for. Baseline characteristics, median age is 59. Boy, these poor 59-year-old people, nothing wrong with them, really don't feel bad at all. Here's the M protein. The bone marrow infiltrate percentage was between 10 and 80%. Wow, imagine that poor person who, you know, if you biopsy them 10 times, it'll range from 7% to 12%. They're unlucky to pay 10%, and now they're getting an auto transplant. Okay, how many people actually had slim criteria? It was about one in three, uh, which is quite a bit. Cytogenetic abnormalities there you see on the screen. All right, you know, these people shouldn't be getting any treatment at all. They're getting this horrific treatment. Screening, 126 people. Induction, 90 people. 88 made it through KRD. 83 made it through transplant. And then they maintain 84 people. Median follow-up now is 70 months or so. Here's what they find. Best response. Objective response rates in the 90%. Who cares? CR rates, 40%, 60%, 70%. You know, that's as good as they can get with this kitchen sink approach to treating these people. MRD negative rates. They're playing games with the denominator. I'm not exactly sure how they get to 58 post denominator. They should be using intention treat denominators. But even with their limited denominators, they're saying it's 43%. That's not that great for going to hell and back for a condition you don't need to be treated and you're at 43% you know, MRD negativity rate at uh, 10 to the minus 5 cutoff. Uh, it could be better. It should be better. I mean, for all this suffering that these patients have undergone. Disposition, they just have biochemical progression after progression after progression. And I'm going to show you that being MRD negative is no guarantee you won't have progression. And that is the key feature here, that they cannot cure anyone. They keep saying cure. I don't think they know what that word means because to do a cure study, as I explained in the prior video on Ascent, you're going to need a sample size of lots and lots of people to show that your survival function is no worse than some non-inferiority margin against covariate match controls. They're not even close to doing a cure trial. They're doing a useless, uncontrolled study with overkill treatment, excessive treatment, treatments that haven't even proven benefit in myeloma, and they have no guardrail. They have no control arm to know that they're actually not harming people. They have a cherry-picked selection bias cohort, and they're, you know, treating them they have no idea what they're doing. They don't even tell you what MRD negative rates they're powered for. It's all hush-hush. Very, very weak study design. Look at the time to biochemical progression. Look at the shape of that curve. You see a tail on that curve? I don't see a tail. I see fairy tales. And that fairy tale is the idea that we can cure this condition. You cannot cure them with even these drugs. Biochemical progression is inevitable. They're all going to progress. This is terrible. Forget about cure. You can't even rid them of this disease. And when they progress, this is what blew me away. When they progress, they make a protocol amendment to give them Darapalm Dex. Are you kidding me? All the people progressing are now getting Darapalm Dex. They got CRD, auto transplant, CRD, Revlimid, and dexamethasone maintenance just to sort of, I don't know, poison them with steroids. And then when they have biochemical rise in M protein, remember, they still don't actually feel bad and they still don't actually have myeloma. Then they give them Darapalm Dex. Unbelievable. So before you've even got myeloma, you've burned through carfilzomib, revlimid, dexamethasone, amelato, revlimid, dexamethasone, dera, palm, and dex. By the time you got myeloma, you got no drugs left. You got no drugs left by the time you got myeloma because these investigators are burning through all the therapies when they shouldn't be giving any therapy at all. And they don't have a control arm. And they're anchoring this to an underpowered phase two study. By the way, it's not a phase three study. I don't care what they're saying. It has no sample size, an overall survival estimate that's extremely unreliable. Also, the original study didn't even use PET-CT at entry, and also the control arm, they get like the worst care imaginable when they progress on the original study. They're not getting Revlimid. Very few people get Revlimid. They're getting VMP and maybe prayer. I don't know what they're getting. It's very subpar therapy by U.S. standards. This Gem Caesar trial is insane. This is what I like to look at. This is the biochemical progression, and what the what's the point here? Well, the point I want to say is that when you pick MRD at a landmark, here are two landmark MRD time points. In other words, they mean people who have achieved MRD by some time point who are either positive or negative. Hey, look at some time point. That's landmark analysis. What they're showing you is that even if you're MRD negative, whatever time point you look at, there are people going to progress anyway. MRD negativity is not a marker of cure. I don't know. The whole field of myeloma, they're so in love with MRD. They've not done basic validation studies. One, they've never proven in any circumstance that people at any time point who are MRD positive benefit from a therapy while those who are MRD negative don't benefit from that therapy. They've never proven that. 
The next thing they've never proven is that drugs that change the fraction of people with MRD negativity also later improve survival quality of life. They haven't validated MRD as a surrogate. They've never proven that either. MRD is prognostic. Sure, of course it is. It's prognostic. Yes, the more you start to measure disease, that ain't good, but it doesn't mean it's actionable. It doesn't mean it's suitable for regulatory purposes. And here it shows you, uh, even when you achieve it, you're going to have disease recurrence. It's not a useful benchmark in the smoldering space. Sobering results. These results undermine MRD, undermines MRD entirely. I see no path forward for MRD until they actually start doing some correct studies, which means you randomize people, you measure MRD, and then you use stratified randomization at that point point to prove that MRD is the thing that matters. What's an example of something that is useful? If I take an echo of somebody and their rejection fraction is 27% versus 50%, I know there are drugs that work at 27% and maybe even ICD placement that works at 27% that does not work at 50%. So that variable is both prognostic. It's not good to have a low ejection fraction. It's also predictive, i.e. there are therapies that only work below some cutoff, but not above some cutoff. And why does cardiology have that? Because they've actually done proper randomized control trials. Why does myeloma not have that? Because they're not doing any correct studies. They're just punch drunk on the idea that these uncontrolled smoldering studies are gonna be useful. They're not doing proper studies to validate these concepts. I see all the ongoing MRD studies. Maybe there's one or two that might even be useful, but the majority are not. And I think we've published on that, Mani and I, or its publication is pending because we have looked at this question. By basically giving you all of the drugs we normally reserve for myeloma, we see with a lot of follow-up and tons of censoring after 60 months, because that's when people enrolled in the study, that progression to actual myeloma is low. But what would it have been for these people in the absence of treatment? And the answer is, they don't know. Because to know that you need a control arm, and also, if you get the drugs later, are you able to achieve the same overall survival? Maybe even better survival and better health-related quality of life because these people are having years of their life that were supposed to be free of drug, free of worry, free of treatment and side effects, now saddled with the misery of auto transplant and DEX maintenance. The misery of DEX maintenance, the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. You maintain somebody with an incredibly intolerable drug. What are you doing? Why are you burning through all the drugs? Why don't you just, pretty soon they're gonna make a protocol map and give them to clistamab too? Maybe, maybe CAR-T as well. Maybe by the time you actually get to myeloma, there'll be no drugs left on earth that you haven't seen. That's not good medical management. Okay, overall survival. I mean, again, it's meaningless. These are all selection bias sample. <clears throat> they have some deaths. They have an MDS on their hands. I don't think that's good. That MDS might be related to drug, very likely. <clears throat> They have one bad outcome during induction. That's certainly a death on their hands. I don't know these people are actually benefit or hurt by this, by this regime of Gem Caesar. Conclusion, Maria Mateo says the conclusion is the curative approach for high-risk smoldering seems encouraging. That's not the conclusion. This field needs reformation. I'm sorry, funding organizations need to defund uncontrolled studies in smoldering myeloma. It is not acceptable to take people with an asymptomatic precancerous condition and allow investigators to basically take them on the island of Dr. Moreau and give them every therapy known to man. There is no control arm to safeguard the well-being of these patients. They could be increasing death by 5% or 10% over doing nothing. We don't know that they aren't. There is no way to protect these patients without a control arm. IRBs have to stop this. You can't let people get autos for high-risk smoldering. Let, what's next, MGUS? You're gonna do autos for, and then measure time to MGUS? Do an auto on a healthy person? This, is, this whole field is out of control. They cannot cure anyone. Proof they cannot cure anyone is no matter what landmark MRD negative status they use, they will get recurrence. This is not a curable disease. These drugs don't cure myeloma and they don't cure precursor myeloma. They're not capable of curing. This is a tough disease. You need controlled, randomized studies. You need to not give every drug to someone before they even have the disease in question. This is dangerous stuff. I mean, they are fueled on groupthink. They're fueled on, they're fueled on groupthink. They're all just talking to each other and goading each other to see who can give the most products to the most asymptomatic patient. This is not acceptable. Regulatory authorities, FDA, you got to stop this. This is really a potential for disaster. If somebody is to find that they're increasing death by 5 or 20%, which is very possible because there's no control arm and these are very cherry-picked patients, it's not going to look good that you're allowing them to do these trials. It is not going to look good on the profession that there is no safeguard in place for these patients. Of course, if you have myeloma and you meet one of these investigators and they tell you that these drugs are so great, 
you have high risk smoldering myeloma, you're very worried, you want to do these things. The purpose of IRBs and scientific regulatory apparatus is to protect somebody from making a choice not in their best interest. We're not protecting these patients. We're failing these patients. These studies are not helpful. They are really not helpful. They all need to have the plug pulled on the study. They need control arms. The control arm is the only way to know that we're not hurting people here. I'm very concerned. Death signals are very high. You're taking healthy people who don't need an auto and you're giving them an auto and you have no proof that they're living longer, living better result from that. You're using the word cure. That's a marketing tactic. And the last thing I'll say is I really worry that these trials are only being launched so that at each center, you have a bunch of rich donors with high-risk smoldering and you need to offer them something. And I worry that that is a potential conflict because all of these centers are making hand over fist money from donors and donors like to be treated. I mean, that's the bias. It's up to doctors and scientists to know that treating is actually in their best interest. We are not learning that in these studies. So, Jem Caesar, whew, I've not seen anything like this. I mean, this is really, this is really renegade stuff. I mean, in CLL, when they tested ibrutinib early, they had the sense to have a control arm and they had the sense to write an appropriate conclusion that we ought not do this. In myeloma, they've totally lost it. Their conflicts are knee deep. It's one of the most expensive diseases. You can blow six hundred or $800,000 per year on drug costs. The companies are making hand over fist revenue. Everyone wants more, more market share. We have to have some safeguards in place. I think all the investigators should be banned from taking financial payments from the company. They can still take their research payments. That's for the research. They don't need to be filling their personal pockets with consulting payments, and they need to stop doing studies like this. IRBs, you're failing right now. I'm gonna make a plea once again. I think anyone who sits on an IRB, if you're listening to this, and there are uncontrolled smoldering myeloma studies in your hospital, you need to stop them right now. They cannot be helpful. This is a disease where we need randomized controlled trials or the studies need to be halted. End of story. This is too much. I've not seen anything like this. This is, and they're just getting egged on by each other. That's what happens when you fill a room of people with groupthink, they egg each other on and you know, uh, I think the net result is very bad for patients. So those are my thoughts. <clears throat> Hopefully next time we have something a little bit more balanced here because I've had my fill of smoldering myeloma studies. Maybe we'll talk about triangle next time. So like this video, you know what to do. Follow Plenary Session Podcast. Watch the video feed. There's some slides here. You're missing on the audio. Until next time.